Welcome to the 2021 ICES Winter Forum, Data and Analytics in Critical Times. For those of you who just attended one of the four workshops, and for those of you signing on only now to our conference, I'm delighted to uh, have you join us for today. My name is Michael Schul. I am the CEO and a senior scientist at ICES, and I'm gonna be your host for today. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of the land where I am located and invite each of you to reflect on the people or peoples who first walked the land where you are, wherever that may be. I'm in Toronto, and that name comes from the Mohawk word Tikaranto, which means place in the waters where the trees stand, though I think today most trees are probably standing in ice. But we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of Tikaranto, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Anishinaabe, the Huron Wendat, and of course, the many other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who continue to call Tikaranto home today. Next, I'd like to introduce Wendy Phillips. Wendy is a, a friend of ICS. Uh, you may have seen her before at our previous uh, uh, forums. Wendy is an Indigenous elder. She is of the Bald Eagle Clan, a Potawatomi and Ojibwa, and a proud member of the, of the Wasoxing First Nation. She's a graduate of Trent University, Fleming College, and George Brown. And Wendy has been faculty for the Indigenous Studies Program and the Business School for Entrepreneurship at the University of Toronto. I'd like to now call upon Wendy to lead us through an opening prayer. Great. So yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. And at this time, I'm going to uh, say a few words in Anishinaabe and I'll uh, translate them as soon as I'm done. Bonjour, Megazito Dem. A will cause a bash got condition cause was oxing the donji. He win zibi in the dungeon bar. Jaman mark get pod what mean down. She may watch can a gay go gosh at top. You shouldn't kiss that. She may watch also can also canak. She may watch wabit on my door. Jaw no bado. Schmuck my dog. You wed my dog. She may watch a key. She may watch no key beneshi. She may watch me. She can. Chimigwach, Mishomas, Nokomas, Wananabojo, Nanwabe, Swabe, Nishade, Chicago, Mamagwas, Wanishambe, Suck. At this time, we uh, give our acknowledgments and our, our gratitude to a being uh, that we describe that has created all things. And we also give our gratitude as well to what we describe are the, the guardians of the four directions. And we also give our acknowledgments as well to the many beings within our creation stories. We also give our acknowledgments as well to what we describe as our true mother. And so this is uh, what we describe as the, the earth and all the, the gifts that she gives us. We also give acknowledgments as well uh, to what we describe as our grandmothers and our grandfathers. And we also give acknowledgments to those ones that gone ahead of us. So at this time, that's what uh, we, we give our, our gratitude for. And so at this time, we, we also think of when we gather together, that there is many things that uh, we are to do when we gather in more than two or three. And, and one is to, to give gratitude and acknowledgements for all the gifts that we receive from creation. So those words have been spoken. The, the next thing that we are to do when we gather is we, we smudge. And, and this is uh, for us as um, not all not all indigenous nations smudge, but um, there's there's quite a few nations that do, and our smudges are usually medicines that are burned, and and that smoke is and we purify our being, and as well the environment around us, and and this is uh, for us. Uh, research is is now catching up as to the importance behind our our ceremonies like this that um, 
90, 95% of the, the bacteria and, and viruses that are on us or surrounding us or the environment around us are eliminated as soon as uh, the, the smudge begins. And within 24 hours, it's the, the space that you smudge is, it's, it becomes 100%. So for us, our, our people uh, knew this, and this is, you know, what we describe as the importance, one, behind our ceremonies, and, and two, the, the importance behind the medicines that we use. And, and this is, you know, for, for us as human beings, that uh, we are human. And, and this is, you know, the, the beauty behind you know, the, the earth and the medicines and the gifts that they give us that allow us to, to be healthy and allow us to, to be well. And so, so for us, the importance of uh, smudging, uh, there's, there's many benefits as to um, how different medicines induce uh, different um, emotions or, or different feelings um, they they help us increase in, in healing and well-being so so for us there's there's many importance behind this uh, ceremony so so that is one thing that uh, I wish to acknowledge at this time the the other thing I wanted to, to mention as well is you know I described um, for for us as as humans as to what we need and and this is you know when we when we talk about our teachings as um, what we need as as human beings and and this is you know for for all human beings and this is you know whether you're young or you're old or it doesn't matter on on gender but the, the things that we need to, to be well and so so this is you know for for us we we talk about how as as humans you know we we all need to to have um, some some type of fluid some type of water um, a lot of us uh, tend to, to have our coffee or tea and um, and and that's what we talk about is to, to what the, the body needs. And we all need uh, some some type of food to to give us that energy and nutrients that the, the body needs. The the other thing that we also need, and this is for for us is what we've described as you know our concerns with our current situation with with COVID is, and this is, you know, what we've seen the impacts already is the, the mental health of people. And and this is something, you know, we, we describe as every human being needs interaction. They they need some some type of human interaction. And, and that's something that we, we talk about is to, to have a, a good being and a good mind that you need, you need that daily interaction. And so, so that for us, you know, when we, when we talk about what, what a human being needs. And, and the last one is to eliminate um, any toxins or waste and to be able to do all those things in a good way. And so, so that's something, you know, we always try to express to people, especially at this time with uh, COVID to, to make sure that all those things you need as, as humans to, to make sure you are, you know, taking care of your, your entire being and to, to make sure that because of the, the lockdown, uh, we're not getting necessarily all those things we, we need. And so, so I like to uh, remind people, you know, that um, in, in this time that, uh, 
we we do need to check on check on our our loved ones and and friends that may may be in isolation and to make sure that they are they are well so so this is this is for us what we um try to to remind each other that uh we we need those things and they they need to be done in in a good way so so that's some of the things i wanted to to mention today especially with you know the the circumstances that um a lot of us are are facing um with with covid and and with the the lockdowns um for us there's there's many teachings as to you know taking care of yourself and and making sure you are doing the the best things you you can at this time so so for us there's there's many things and you know i'll i'll talk more um about that at, at another time but uh i would like to to say that uh i wish that uh whether it's the the speakers or the the panelists or you know the the people everybody who's listening that um you you have a mind you know and that you're that you have that uh good heart and um to to be able to to listen to those things that are being said today and that you can be open to to the new things that you're hearing and so so for us um we ask that uh those those words that are spoken today that um they're kind and that uh, people people remember you know what what their presentations are and so, so we ask for all those good things. And so I'd like to uh, say a big thank you for everybody coming uh, this morning. And we ask that uh, everybody will have a good day. And, and yes, I'd like to say again, thank you to the team for, for bringing us all together like this in a good way. So miigwech and thank you, Michael. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks for those remarks and, and, and your prayers, which help to put us in a reflective mindset for the discussions that are to come. It's a true delight to be speaking to you today, even if it is virtually at our 2021 uh, ICS Winter Forum. We've gathered a stellar group of speakers and panelists. We have a full agenda. And most important, we have over 800 registrants, which is an incredible uh, record, uh, 400 for the workshops. Uh, and these are from Ontario, from across Canada, and even some internationally. I want to start by thanking our core sponsors, the Ontario Ministry of Health, the Ontario Strategy for Patient-Oriented or Sport uh, uh, Research Support Unit, and our platinum sponsor, IQVIA. Please visit the sponsor page on the Whova platform to learn more and check out IQVS video presentation. It's difficult to process just how much our world has changed in the last year. Indeed, it is not even 12 months since Ontario first declared a state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic, sending the government, the health and public health systems, schools, businesses, and the people of Ontario as a whole into uncharted waters. And of course, the rest of the world is bobbing around in much the same storm as we are in to this day. The effects of the pandemic have been severe. In Ontario alone, almost 6,700 deaths of the 21,000 that have occurred across Canada so far. Ontario has seen over 280,000 cases of COVID-19, which is undoubtedly a, a, an underestimate, and has conducted over 10 million COVID-19 PCR tests of the 23 million that have been conducted nationwide. In Ontario, hundreds of critically ill ICU patients have been transferred across town or across the province to manage their need for care and balance the demands on hospitals. Businesses shut, kids out of school, disparities worsened, the vulnerable rendered more vulnerable, and all of us living a life we could scarcely have imagined not even one year ago. Many of us have gotten used to a life at home, largely isolated from those we don't live with, annoyed by the endless video meetings and inadequate bandwidth. But we know that for many others who don't have the ability to work from home or whose essential jobs require them to be on site, healthcare workers, 
personal support workers, grocery clerks, first responders, transit workers, essential retail workers, those working in food processing and other manufacturing. These individuals, much more likely to be racialized, immigrants, often poorly paid and with no or inadequate sick leave, they have not had the luxury of complaining about too many Zoom calls or not being able to get a haircut. They have had to try to keep themselves, those they work with, and those they live with healthy, despite working conditions that make it harder to do so. Meanwhile, the story of the devastation that COVID-19 has wrought to elderly and vulnerable Canadians living in long-term care homes across this country is nothing short of a historic national tragedy. Our homes, our workplaces, our hospitals and clinics, our schools, our gyms, even our parks, all have been transformed by the pandemic. Our workplace, ICS, has also had to adapt and pivot quite dramatically. Even before the state of emergency, we were already working with scientists on predictive models to help hospitals plan for the pandemic. Once the state of emergency was declared, our management team focused first on the core responsibility of keeping staff and scientists safe and healthy. Almost overnight across the entire ICS network, our people embraced the transition to full-time work from home. Teams across the organization rallied to enable their colleagues to perform at their best, rolling out IT solutions, data security enhancements, health and wellness resources, and a steady stream of information and supports. The ICS community not only maintained core operations throughout this upheaval, but ramped up productivity to an intense level, driven by the pressing demands of the health system for COVID-19 related research and analytics. Strong partnerships and collaborations allowed us to urgently expand and improve key data holdings to address pandemic driven questions. We began to obtain more frequent updates of core databases, including daily feeds of COVID-19 test results, providing real-time information about COVID-19 testing to health and public health leaders across Ontario. Our experts volunteered for committees and working groups advising the government on its response. Our staff and scientists delved into the pressing questions asked by policymakers while also leading their own COVID-19 research. And of course, many of the clinician researchers at ICS were also donning and doffing PPE as they got even busier providing care for COVID-19 and other patients in the clinics, hospitals, and care homes they work in. Like many of you, many of our staff worked long days and weekends for weeks on end to ensure provincial leaders receive daily COVID-19 reports. We published and promoted these to help ensure decision makers and the public had information they needed. We openly shared our intellectual property with partners like the Ministry of Health, including data science innovations that enhance the consistency of COVID-19 test data across the province. And we become a primary partner in the Ministry of Health's new Ontario Health Data Platform, which leverages our expertise in analytic infrastructure, including in machine learning, and creates wider opportunities for accessing Ontario health data for COVID-19 related research projects. All of this activity means we currently have about 120 active COVID-19 research and analytic projects underway and 45 projects approved in the Ontario Health Data Platform's ICS environment. As we meet together today, Canada and the world remain in the midst of the COVID-19 response. The story is not over yet. Ontario's decision and policymakers watch as case numbers from the second wave slowly decline. They plan for vaccination scale up once the vaccine supply reliably increases, and they prepare for the possibility that new variants of concern may lead to an even larger third wave of COVID-19. Data, models, and analyses underpin and inform these decisions. And today we're gonna to hear from leading experts discussing important aspects of the past, present, and future of the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the day, we also want to hear from you. We invite you to pose lots of questions in the Whoba chat. Each segment include, will include opportunities for Q&A, and we're going to strive to put as many of, you, of your questions as possible to our speakers. Now, I'd like to introduce a, uh, a, a, a video a welcome from uh, Christine Elliott, Ontario's Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Throughout the pandemic, ICS has worked closely with the Ministry of Health building on the strong partnership that's evolved over 29 years. And I'm pleased that the minister was able to take the time to record this video for our conference today. Hello, everyone. 
I'm Christine Elliott, Ontario's Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. I want to start by thanking everyone at ICES, including the world-class researchers, data and clinical experts, as well as everyone here today for your shared commitment to build healthier communities, even in the face of unprecedented challenges. I would also like to commend the important work that ICES does every day, turning population-based health research into evidence that supports effective health care policy so that we can deliver better health outcomes for all Ontarians. This has never been more important than it is right now. Our government's top priority has always been supporting the health and well-being of Ontarians. That's why we are using every resource at our disposal to keep communities safe. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the value of health data and digital health care to support and enhance Ontario's pandemic planning and response. Health data plays a critical role in providing our government with an evidence-based understanding of how the COVID-19 virus and variants of concern can be transmitted throughout our communities and how to identify them and stop them. We have supported our public health units to migrate to the provincial data system known as Case and Contact Management System or CCM. As a central data repository, CCM has enhanced how public health units report new cases of COVID-19 and variants of concern to the province and accelerated how we can turn actionable data into effective health policy. And as we receive more COVID-19 vaccines from the federal government, maintaining access to population-based health data will continue to support our immunization program, such as by helping our government better understand the distribution and effectiveness of vaccines across the province. To reduce the spread of the virus and variants of concern in our communities, we continue to leverage integrated data and deep analytics to drive decision-making and inform Ontario's pandemic planning and response. In partnership with DNA Stack, we are working to immediately establish a genomics data bank with a real-time analytics dashboard. This will enhance the province's capacity to identify known and emerging variants of COVID-19. By using made in Ontario health data and technology, we can further empower our public health officials and enhance Ontario's pandemic planning and response. And as we look ahead, our government continues to invest in the creation of the Ontario Health Data Platform to support COVID-19 research and analytics. ICES has been a critical partner on this initiative and thank you for your support and partnership on this valuable project as we leverage health data to build a more connected, responsive and patient-centered health system for patients and clinicians. To close, I want to thank you for all your efforts in the fight against COVID-19 and for your ongoing support to modernize our healthcare system. Together, we are making a difference in the lives of Ontarians, and I look forward to our continued collaboration moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Elliott. So now on to the first panel of the day. I am pleased to introduce the moderator of the panel, Dr. Susan Bronskittle, Senior Scientist and Life Stage Research Program Lead at ICS, and a key contributor to the COVID-19 related research and analytics at ICS. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Michael. Well, welcome everyone to the first plenary session of the ICS Winter Forum. Today's uh, topic is COVID-19 vaccines, using data to support distribution, uptake and impact. We'll have approximately one hour to explore this important area together. And we have three terrific speakers for you today. Dr. Michael Hilmer is the Assistant Deputy Minister of Capacity Planning and Analytics Division at the Ontario Ministry of Health. Michael will discuss uh, the required data infrastructure for information on vaccines as they are rolled out in Ontario and focus on what types of information are being collective, collected and how. Dr. Sarah Wilson is a physician lead in health protection at Public Health Ontario. She's an assistant professor at the Dalana School of Public Health and an adjunct scientist at ICES. Sarah will highlight the groups excluded from vaccine trials and the need for real-world vaccine effectiveness data on these populations. 
She'll also address vaccine safety and present an overview of what we are seeing in passive vaccine safety surveillance in Ontario. Dr. Jeff Kwong is an epidemiologist, a specialist in public health and preventive medicine, and a family physician. He's the program leader of the Populations and Public Health Program at ICES. Jeff will extend the material presented by Sarah to a national perspective through work he is leading, funded by the Canadian Immunization Research Network. I want to remind all of you that this is going to be a discussion. The panelists will present for approximately 10 minutes each, and then we will collectively take questions. On the conference website, I think you've already seen that there's a place for you to ask your questions on the right-hand side of the screen. These will be forwarded to us, and we'll discuss as many as we can in the time available. So let's get started. First um, is going to be Dr. Sarah Wilson. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And I'm just gonna take a moment to uh, share my screen here. Just wanna see everyone. Uh, I'll assume that you can all see the screen there. I'm looking to see if Susan is nodding there. Okay, great. Okay, so um, as Susan had mentioned, I'm going to um, focus my talk in terms of COVID vaccines on safety, and I'll be sharing with you some of our um, passive vaccine safety surveillance data from Ontario to date, and then highlighting some of the complementary approaches that will augment this surveillance system data. And I have no disclosures to declare, in particular, no relationships with vaccine manufacturers. So in terms of background, um, I think everyone's aware that public confidence is very tightly linked to perceptions of vaccine safety. And the COVID-19 vaccine program is unprecedented in terms of its complexity and scale. When we're talking about a COVID vaccine program, of course, we're talking about a program that will involve multiple different vaccines, different manufacturers and different vaccine platforms. And so for all of these reasons, it's absolutely crucial for us to have real-time program monitoring, including in particular in terms of vaccine safety. So this is a, a quite a busy infographic. It was released last week by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Not to worry, I'm not gonna walk you through all of the different elements here, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of different points. One is at the top left corner of the infographic, just highlighting that vaccine safety, of course. The first focus of vaccine safety efforts is pre-licensure, studying adverse events in clinical trial populations. And then further work continues as we move into licensure, including quality assessment by uh, Health Canada, and then into this bottom left-hand panel that's described here as monitoring, but is really referencing Canada's passive vaccine safety surveillance system. So the vaccine safety system that I'm describing is, is oftentimes termed as post-marketing vaccine safety surveillance because this is understanding the vaccine safety once vaccines are implemented in programs and implemented in the real world um, outside of the constructs of clinical trials. So I thought it'd be helpful just to highlight some of the, the primary objectives of passive vaccine safety surveillance. And I think one of its most important aims and contributors is given wide scale deployment of vaccines in large populations, there is then the ability, the statistical power in terms of the numbers of vaccinated individuals to be able to identify very rare events that wouldn't have been detected in clinical trials that might involve 40 or 50,000 individuals. Another aim of passive vaccine safety surveillance is also to identify increases in known events. So in the adverse event monitoring of clinical trials, sometimes there's events that are detected at very low levels, but it's important to understand if those, if the, if, uh, those are observed at an increased frequency once vaccines are deployed in the real world, and also to identify if there's any predisposing conditions or factors associated with those events. And then, of course, very fundamentally, we want to have a safety surveillance system that has the capacity and the ability to identify any other potential vaccine safety signals that would require further assessment and, of course, regulatory action, which could include changes to the product monograph. So that's already occurred in the setting of mRNA vaccines with Health Canada changing the product monographs to include spe special reference to anaphylaxis. And then, of course, other, other regulatory actions like holds or recalls. 
I wanted to also just walk you through this other uh, portion of the slide here on the right hand portion of the slide just to highlight the different um, organizations and the different components involved in passive vaccine safety surveillance. So starting first with the completion of an as adverse event case report form. Uh, these are uh, most commonly filled out by healthcare providers, but in Ontario, about 30% of our reports we receive from vaccine recipients themselves. These are then sent to public health units who oftentimes collect additional information and um, ask additional questions that can help with classifying the event using a surveillance case definition. We receive these at Public Health Ontario. We do our own analysis and I'll be sharing some of our, um, our data from Ontario in an upcoming slide. And then this information is shared with the Public Health Agency of Canada at the client level, so record level events. And they're receiving this information from other Canadian provinces and territories. And this is what comprises the Canadian Adverse Event Following Immunization Surveillance System or CAFIS. This information is also shared pardon me, also shared with Health Canada. Um, and so they maintain the Canada Vigilance Database and they're also receiving uh, information from ma vaccine manufacturers and that's codified under the Food and Drugs Act in Canada. They're the, the absolute requirement for vaccine manufacturers to report information to Health Canada. And then Health Canada and pu the Public Health Agency of Canada, of course, also participate in the global vaccine safety community and are hearing information through passive vaccine safety surveillance that are implemented across, um, across all countries deploying COVID vaccines. So I thought I'd also just spend a couple moments, I mentioned earlier in terms of the information that public health units collect, it's really important for that information collection to occur so that public health units and us at Public Health Ontario have um, some understanding of sort of how the events are being classified using surveillance case definitions. And this is really important when we're thinking about aggregating information across Canada, but also sharing information across countries. It's really important for us when we're talking about about, for example, anaphylaxis, that I'm talking about the same thing that you're talking about, the same thing that the United States is talking about, et cetera. And so the Brighton Collaboration is a vaccine safety uh, network. It's been in place for more than 20 years, and they've developed standardized case definitions that assist with this goal of standardized case definitions. And uh, just by way of example, I've listed an example there for anaphylaxis, but there's different levels of diagnostic certainty uh, reflected in levels one, two, and three. And this is really important in terms of, as I mentioned, this, this standardized collection of information within surveillance systems. So in terms of what we're seeing to date in Ontario, in terms of our passive vaccine safety surveillance, I have information here on the slide that includes adverse events reported up to February 6th. We are reviewing our data on a daily basis at Public Health Ontario. And then on a weekly basis, we are producing a, an epi summary of these AP reports. We're just in the process of finalizing our data for the report that will be uh, published on our website tomorrow. So over this period of mid-December to February 6th, we received 287 AFI reports following almost 380,000 doses of COVID vaccines administered in Ontario. So this works out to a reporting rate of about 76 events per 100,000 doses administered. Or if you look at this as a proportion, um, the number of AFI reports reflect 0.08% of all doses administered. So a very, very small number. In terms of the events themselves, all but four were non-serious and our definition of serious in Ontario, we use um, an approach recommended by the World Health Organization for the purposes of our weekly reporting. Essentially, it's hospitalizations and deaths. And the four serious events were all um, events that required hospitalization. And two of these were events managed as anaphylaxis. So here's another figure that just depicts the um, different events that we've received where there has been at two or more events um, under the various classifications. So you can see that our top two events representing more than 53% of all, all events that we've received to date are either allergic skin reactions or injection site reactions. So pain, redness or swelling at the injection site. Um, and then a little bit further down in the figure, you can see um, anaphylaxis, which I'm, we're going to shift our attention to in a moment, uh, with 15 total reports, uh, representing 5% of all the reports that we've received to date. 
So I wanted just to walk you through some additional information about anaphylaxis, drawing on my earlier comments about the importance of the Brighton collaboration in terms of diagnostic certainty. So this is a, a slide that it's a little bit busy, but highlights the information in terms of both um, all of that, all, pardon me, all products for anaphylaxis, and then also breaking these down by vaccine product in terms of Pfizer and Moderna. So you can see, as I mentioned earlier, that we've received 15 reports in total, but after application of Brighton uh, collaboration case definition, so restricting these to those meeting levels one, two, and three, we go down to six reports five from Pfizer and one from Moderna, but if you look at the doses administered between the two products, we have you know, relatively similar uh, reporting rates. So uh, per million doses, 16 per million for all products, 16.6 um, for Pfizer and just under, or just about 13 per million for Moderna. So how does this compare to what uh, other jurisdictions are reporting? Um, sorry, I'm just moving this around a little bit. Um, so in the clinical trials, um, in the likely due to the exclusion criteria in those clinical trials, uh, there was one event of anaphylaxis reported in the Pfizer pivotal trial and no events of anaphylaxis in the Moderna trial. In terms of the CAFIS data I mentioned to you earlier, in terms of the reporting by the Public Health Agency of Canada, as of February 5th, there were 29 events reported. These all meet Brighton levels one through three, which is a reporting rate of about 28 events per million doses, so a fair bit higher than what we're seeing in Ontario. And then looking at the U.S. picture, there was a nice article in JAMA last week that described the experience of VAERS, so the U.S. Passive Vaccine Safety Surveillance System. And so there they're reporting um, reporting rates for Pfizer of 5 per million doses administered and for Moderna, 2.5 per million doses administered. But I think this requires a, a little bit of um, contextualizing. I mean, this is a different surveillance system. But based on information presented at ACIP, at the end of January, it looks like the reporting rate to VAERS is about half of what we're seeing in Ontario right now. Excuse me, so the reporting rate is about 42 per 100,000. And in the JAMA report, um, quite a number of these anaphylaxis reports were, ho were requiring hospitalization. So about half of all of these events required hospitalization. And half of those, so about 25% or a little bit more actually, um, were actually requiring ICU, so ICU admission. So I think that uh, what VAERS is capturing is probably a much more clinically severe picture of anaphylaxis, which might explain why we're seeing quite difference, quite a bit of difference in terms of our reporting rates. So I wanted just to leave you with some higher level comments about vaccine safety, although it's quite interesting to look at anaphylaxis, which has certainly emerged as a vaccine safety signal. I mentioned earlier just the changes to the product monograph. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that anaphylaxis remains a very rare event after immunization. It's a recognized event in terms of its possible association with immunization. And for that reason, all immunizers are trained and know how to respond to anaphylaxis. All of the events that I mentioned earlier, regardless of Brighton collaboration classification, all have fully recovered. Um, and so I just want to leave you with the message that although it's interesting to look at, anaphylaxis is rare, it can be um, appropriately managed, um, and um, you know, is I think something that we're well equipped to manage in Ontario immunization sites. The safety profile of COVID vaccines continues to be reassuring. In Canada, we've administered more than 1 million doses, but of course, other countries are much further ahead and also have strong vaccine safety surveillance networks in place and have not found any notable vaccine safety signals after tens of millions of vaccine doses administered. And of course, we'll be continuing to monitor vaccine safety as doses continue to roll out and products, um, additional products come online. So I just wanted to um, just, just close with a, a couple of, um, I think, highlights in terms of also setting the stage for some of the, some of the details that Jeff will be presenting on. So, so I think passive vaccine safety surveillance is, is really essential. It's a really important component of our approach to vaccine safety monitoring. But of course, it's not a standalone system and it requires other complementary approaches. So I wanted to highlight some of the things that I think that the work that uh, Jeff will be leading at through work at ICES will really be able to help with. And this includes the ability to do 
um, hypothesis testing, so with specific methodologic designs that can answer uh, specific questions about particular associations. And then this piece around of special populations. So um, as everyone's aware, the pivotal clinical trials for mRNA vaccines include, excluded a number of important groups and will have the opportunity to assess both the safety and the effectiveness of these populations through strategies involving administrative data or perinatal registries, et cetera. And then finally, there is also the concept of active vaccine safety surveillance. So passive vaccine safety surveillance, we wait for the reports to be sent to public health. But active vaccine safety surveillance involves proactively contacting people to learn about their experience after vaccines. And Ontario has recently partnered with the Canadian National Vaccine Safety or a Canvas network to do this for COVID vaccines. Uh, so this started earlier in February. Uh, the Canvas lead for Ontario is Dr. Matthew Mueller out of Unity Health. If you're interested in learning more about this project, you can visit the website. And basically what it involves is after receiving a COVID vaccine, individuals after they enroll will receive um, online questionnaires to ask them about symptoms after vaccination. So they'll be receiving a questionnaire at day eight after dose one, dose two and six months after the series has been completed, asking about symptoms, work absenteeism, and then of course also any medically attended events that would, re that would require then a completion of an AFI form and then we'd be receiving that at Public Health Ontario to ensure it enters into our passive vaccine safety surveillance system. So I think this is a really important component of our vaccine safety strategy in Ontario and just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of it and, and um, would certainly encourage you to check out the website to read more. So thanks very much for the opportunity to be a part of this session. I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues at Public Health Ontario and Vaccine Safety and the Ontario Canvas team and looking forward to answering questions at the end of the panel. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. That was terrific. As you were showing the actual numbers for adverse events, I, as a data, nerd, I was so excited that there were actually numbers behind the vaccine rollout and it made it feel a lot more real. Although, I mean, the whole thing is just um, so unsettling to be excited about adverse event numbers. <laughs> um, I've been asked to just, um, we'll, we'll take questions for everybody at the end. Yeah. I've been asked to clarify for people on the conference site to put your questions in the Q&A box. I think there's a chat box and a Q&A box. So make sure you put your questions in the Q&A box. They are starting to come through to us. Um, and I think we'll have a, a robust discussion. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Kwong next. Um, over to you, Jeff. Great. Okay, let me just share my screen. And uh, here we go. And Okay. Is that, everything look good? Okay, yeah. excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about planned COVID-19 vaccine studies uh, using large linkable databases. I just have uh, no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. So just a quick overview, I'll give a brief background, talk about the data infrastructure that's gonna support all the work and then the four objectives, um, you know, four kind of bodies of, of uh, areas of uh, research that we're gonna be doing. Uh, looking at background rates of adverse events of special interests or ACEs, uh, vaccine coverage, vaccine safety, and vaccine effectiveness. Okay, so the Canadian Immunization Research Network, or CERN, was created in 2015 to conduct uh, various types of um, vaccine research across Canada. And so this is like a network of networks that's funded by CIHR. And one of the networks is the Provincial Collaborative Network that I'm the co-lead of uh, with Shannon McDonald at the University of Alberta. And the PCN conducts uh, public health relevant vaccine research and evaluation uh, using provincial databases. And so when uh, with COVID, we've obtained funding uh, from CIHR um, to conduct uh, post-market uh, surveillance studies of COVID-19 vaccines. And we're also uh, seeking additional funding from the Canadian uh, COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so our, the participating part, uh, provinces are the, the five that are listed here, um, and they total up to um, 30 million people uh, across Canada. And so represent, oh, sorry, 34 million representing 90% uh, of the Canadian population. And we may also be adding 
um, uh, Nova Scotia as well, and that's uh, hopefully in the works. So you can see the institutions, a lot of the public health institution uh, agencies across uh, the country, so well connected uh, with uh, public health and, and government uh, for this work. So the key, I'm going to talk a, a bit about the data infrastructure that's going to be supporting this work. Uh, this is available in each of the provinces that I mentioned. Um, so we've got uh, clearly uh, the most important piece will be the COVID-19 vaccination data. And Mike will be uh, speaking more about that. Um, and that's going to be obviously the most important piece. Um, next, we need the COVID-19 laboratory testing data. Uh, in Ontario, that's, you know, uh, with the uh, PCR testing data that we're getting a daily feeds of. And then looking at outcomes or health services use, uh, we'll, have, we'll be looking at mortality, uh, hospitalizations, in, including ICU admissions, uh, emergency department visits, and also uh, it's, it's good to have physician office visits as well um, for looking at uh, comorbidities. Um, so looking at uh, populations of interest, obviously the long-term care population is very important. Um, so that's a, a key priority group. Um, then there are, you know, age groups of interest, you know, whether they're um, older adults or children, um, you know, we want to look at uh, how well these vaccines are performing and the safety profiles in various age groups. Uh, we want to look at uh, various uh, people with various chronic conditions. And on the next slide, I'll outline some of the, the uh, ch chronic conditions that we'll be looking at. Uh, we also want to look at pregnant women, uh, immigrants and refugees. So we have the uh, IRCC uh, landed immigrant database at ICS. Um, indigenous populations, we've, we've um, you know, commenced uh, conversations with the Indigenous uh, portfolio at ICS to look at uh, First Nations communities uh, and possibly uh, Métis uh, in, in Ontario. Uh, and we can also use algorithms uh, to identify uh, the homeless population that have recently been developed by our colleagues at ICS Western. Um, on the right hand side, you can see we're interested in looking at different geographic regions. So in Ontario, uh, we'd be interested in looking at the public health unit. Um, and then also using census data, we can identify areas uh, where there are uh, greater proportions of people who are at increased risk of COVID-19. So the ones that we've identified you know, so far that we are all aware of are you know, essential workers. So people who have to work outside the home uh, who are at greater risk of um, acquiring COVID infection. Um, you know, areas where there's larger household sizes, we know that if, we know that if there's multi-generational households, there's greater risk of transmission within the household. Um, you know, people with lower income or education, uh, visible minorities and recent immigrants. So all of these are important uh, risk factors uh, for COVID-19. Uh, looking at these chronic medical conditions, these are using uh, validated algorithms applied to the health administrative data. So, you know, respiratory conditions, cardiac, uh, conditions, hypertension, diabetes, cancer. Um, and on the right hand side, you know, in particular, we're interested in immunocompromised. Um, so people with HIV, those who have received transplants, those are on immunosuppressive medications. Also, uh, people with autoimmune diseases, and we've developed a number of algorithms at ICS, um, you know, that, to identify people with rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, and lupus. Um, just as some examples of, of folks with autoimmune diseases. Then we're also interested in people with uh, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, dementia, uh, and a history of stroke. Um, so, um, so the first area of research is looking at background rates of ACEs. And so um, Sarah nicely mentioned the Brighton Collaboration. They've developed a list of, of ACEs. So these are ad adverse events of special interest. They're not necessarily related to a vaccine, um, but they could be. And so these ACEs are, are events that have been identified that have you know, either a known association with other vaccines or they're theoretically uh, related to COVID-19 infection. So you know, we know the pathophysiology of COVID-19 that can cause some of these conditions. And so there's a whole range of them, um, you know, immunologic, um, respiratory, cardiovascular, uh, hematologic. Um, there's like a whole list of like literally dozens of these. And so, you know, estimating background is important so that we can, you know, we can have an idea if we start to see, you know, a, a great increase in these, uh, you know, is that, you know, more than what we'd expect. And so the Public Health Agency of Canada is using a CAIHI data uh, to estimate background rates of ACEs that result in e uh, emergency department visits or hospitalizations uh, during the pre-pandemic and the pandemic pre-vaccine periods. And we're working with them on that. And at ICS, uh, we're also looking at uh, background rate for ACEs 
in both the long-term care population and the non-long-term care population. Um, and we're supporting the work uh, at FAC. So just to give you uh, just a taste of some of the work we've done, um, you know, this is the number of uh, monthly number of long-term care residents over time for 10 years, uh, you know, from 2010 to 2019. So you can see it's pretty stable, uh, you know, somewhere between 82,000 to 84,000 uh, residents in long-term care each month. And you can see that in 2020, um, there was a dramatic decrease in the number of residents in long-term care um, that started, you know, going down in April. Um, all the way and it persisted into the fall. So a drop of about 10,000 residents in, in long-term care facilities in Ontario, um, you know, since the start of the pandemic. And looking at all cause mortality, um, this is the rate of deaths from any cause uh, per 100 people in long-term care. You can see there's some seasonality here, um, you know, that there's higher, uh, you know, percent uh, death in uh, January and December and lower in the summer, but pretty stable. Um, over you know these ten years, and you can see that in 2020 um, there was a, quite a spike uh, in April and May, um, and then it, it went back down to the baseline levels um, in the summer and in the fall. And we can't quite capture the wave two events uh, at yet, um, but we'll see what they show uh, in a few months. Um, and looking at hospitalizations, once again stable um, over you know ten year period, and then in 2020 uh, you can see that there was a dramatic decrease in hospitalizations. Either people, you know, um, you know, uh, they were not being admitted to hospital out of fear of, of uh, you know, co uh, contracting COVID or because, um, you know, hospitals were not accepting uh, uh, residents, uh, long-term care residents who, you know, where the, the facility was having an outbreak. And uh, the rates, hospitalization rates, you know, stayed low um, throughout the summer. And then emergency department visits, uh, once again, stable. And then you can see, uh, you know, quite a dramatic a decrease in emergency department visits. Um, that's gradually coming back up, but it, it had dropped quite a bit in April. And this, you know, these sorts of uh, decreases in healthcare use may have actually contributed to mortality. Uh, maybe people who should have been going to emerge were not uh, being sent to emerge, and then they may have died uh, in the long-term care a home as, as a consequence. So I think it's important to do this sort of work so that we can see what happens, you know, with the rollout of the vaccine program, we have to take, you know, the patterns of healthcare use in 2020 in the context of the pandemic, um, you know, take those into consideration as well. Um, so we may see lower or higher event rates, uh, you know, from the ACs um, in 2021, and we need to take um, them into consideration. So we're gonna repeat this work for the non-LTC population as well. And then we're going to look at the specific ACs, and that's all uh, work that's underway. Okay, so the next area is looking at vaccine coverage. So obviously, we'd want to estimate coverage um, in multiple time points, you know, both for the overall population, for smaller regions, and also subpopulation of interest. And we want to do it by vaccine product and also the number of doses received. So whether people receive one dose or two doses of, you know, for vaccines that where they require two doses. And we want to look in the LTC population. So ideally, we'd like to look at, you know, not just residents, but also staff uh, and essential care workers. And we look at it by facility. Uh, and for non-long-term care, we'd want to look at groups that are increased risk of COVID-19 infection and those, you know, and or severe outcomes. And we don't also want to look at it by region. And I think it's really important to look at this from a health equity lens. Um, we know that um, there have been a lot of groups have been, you know, disproportionately burdened by COVID-19 infection. We want to make sure that they're not the ones who also fall behind in getting a COVID-19 vaccine. And so here's a map that's, um, you know, from the ICS COVID-19 dashboard from last week, where we showed that there's, um, you know, huge disparities in, you know, this is looking at the number of people per 100 who have ever tested positive for COVID-19, um, you know, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and it's by Ford Sertation Area, or FSA, and we've excluded the long-term care residents. And you can see that some areas in this dark red here have had, you know, as much as 6% of the population who have had a confirmed COVID-19 infection. So you can see uh, Peel region, uh, you know, is quite dark here, as well as, you know, parts of Toronto, um, you know, in the Northwest and, you know, in Scarborough here in the East, uh, where there have been uh, very high rates of, of COVID-19 infection. So we want to make sure that these areas, um, you know, uh, you know, do get a, a good access to the COVID-19 vaccine um, and then that there's not inequities that are exacerbated by the vaccination rollout. 
Uh, moving on, the next big area is vaccine safety. And so there's, an, um, you know, Sarah gave a great uh, overview of the, the passive uh, vaccine safety surveillance and active vaccine surveillance. What I think we'll mostly be doing is a lot of the hypothesis testing studies. So if there are, um, you know, signals detected in, uh, you know, through this uh, active or passive uh, surveillance or in RCTs, we can actually test with this uh, larger data set, you know, where we've got, you know, you know, tens of millions of people who have been vaccinated to see if there are, you know, true associations. So we want to look at populations that are excluded from RCTs, for instance, like long-term care residents, people with autoimmune disorders, pregnant women, as just some examples. We can look at severe and or rare uh, adverse events, and we can look at, um, you know, safety, you know, specific to each product. And so we can use different study designs, including the cohort study design, uh, case control, uh, and the self-control case series, uh, which I'll spend the next slide explaining a little bit. Um, so the self-controlled case series is a nice study design where we use each person as their own control. So we take people who have had both the exposure and the outcome. So in this case, the exposure would be COVID-19 vaccination, and the outcome could be any of the ACs that I mentioned. And what we do is we define uh, risk intervals and control intervals for each person. And so, you know, the dark green here is the control interval and the light green here is the risk interval. And so what we do is we, you know, here are two hypothetical patients and we're just looking for, um, everyone has had both the vaccine and had the AC and we're looking at when the ACs occur relative to the vaccine. Are there more events occurring in the risk interval compared to the control interval? And if so, then you can say that there's an association between the exposure and the outcome. Um, it, but if there is no increased rate during the risk interval compared to the control interval, then you can say that there probably isn't an association. So that's just one example of a study design that we'll, we'll be using to evaluate uh, vaccine safety. And next, uh, for vaccine effectiveness, uh, we can look at severe outcomes. Um, you know, once again, populations excluded from RCTs. Uh, we can look at alternative dosing schedules, you know, for people who have received only one dose, or if there's been an increased interval, you know, beyond the three or four weeks. Uh, of when they're supposed to get the second dose. And we can also look at mixed regimens. So people who have received you know, one dose of one product and another dose of another product to see what their vaccine effectiveness is like. We, uh, we can also generate product specific estimates. We can look at duration of protection, you know, how long is the protection uh, from the vaccine. And then we can also look at, you know, for those who have previously had COVID-19 infection, you know, are they, do they have higher or lower VE compared to those who have, haven't had a previous infection? And once again, we're planning to use a cohort design a or we can use case control design and also the test negative design. And here's just a schematic of the test negative design where we take people who have, um, have symptomatic infection and they've been swabbed. This is what we normally use for influenza vaccine effectiveness studies and they've been shown to the estimates you know, from this design have been shown to be similar to RCTs. And we take those who test positive and we treat them as cases and those who test negative, we treat them as controls. And we just take one minus the odds ratio where we take the odds of vaccination and those who test positive divided by the odds of vaccination and those who test negative. And then one minus that it, uh, the odds ratio is just the vaccine effectiveness estimate. So I'd just like to conclude by thanking uh, the study team. There's lots of people in, in all the provinces mentioned uh, who've contributed to this and I'm happy to answer any questions during the question period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's great to see the beginnings of um, some of the potential studies for um, looking at effectiveness of the vaccines. Our last speaker this morning will be Dr. Michael Hilmer, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the inputs, in a sense, into what uh, both Sarah and Jeff had been talking about. So, Michael, did you want to share your slides with the group now? Yeah, thanks so much, Susan, um, and thanks for uh, uh, being uh, accommodating with the uh, the change. And, and my apologies for being a bit late. I'll just uh, double check that everybody can uh, can see my screen here. I'll just put it into presentation mode. Yeah. Okay, great. So. Um, uh, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Um, just a quick time check, uh, Susan. How how much time do you want me to take to run through this? We've had a whole series of questions come in while Jeff and Sarah have been talking. So if you can keep it to 10 minutes, that would be terrific. Yeah, I'll, I'll aim for, for shorter than that. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, uh, the, the collection of, of vaccine uh, data of uh, 
COVID-19 vaccine data. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, of, of the, uh, the application COVAX Ontario uh, that is being used for uh, collection of, of vaccination information. And so this is a, a point of care system that is provincial in nature. It is being used at all the, um, the vaccine delivery locations, whether it is um, uh, a, a, a clinic or, or a mobile team administering to a long-term care home or retirement home. And, um, and it, it, it is an end-to-end -end solution that has uh, in its final iteration you know, everything from inventory management to uh, registration scheduling uh, to, um, uh, to, to clinical management of the vaccine event itself, all the way to, um, uh, uh, you know, real-time reporting to, to the kinds of secondary uses that, uh, that uh, Jeff was talking about as I, as I came onto the line. And I think it's important to remember at its, at its heart, um, uh, uh, COVAX is a, a uh, to capture the, a clinical event of vaccination. So, so it's really designed around that, and it's it's got important information about you know who is receiving the vaccination, uh, details about their um, identity, um, whether that's health card number or, or something else, the reason for administration, um, you know whether you're a, a long-term care resident or a healthcare worker, etc. Uh, the site where it's being delivered, um, details about uh, the dose, the arm it went into, uh, lot number, you can see some of the details are there on the bottom right uh, of, the, of the screen. And so this is kind of what um, COVAX looks like to, um, uh, to somebody who's using it as a, as a, as a clinician administering the vaccine. And, and so uh, I thought I would just talk a little bit about the different models. So you can see here there there are um, different models depending on the 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 model of administration of the vaccine itself. So um, there is the kind of you come to us model. These are the uh, the immunization clinics, whether they're at hospitals or or some other kind of setting, and there there'd be an administration uh, set up and and you know different data entry people supporting the uh, entry of information into the into the COVAX system. Um, the we come to you model. This was used extensively to get out to the long-term care homes uh, in some of these other settings where where clinics weren't feasible, and so there's a whole um, apparatus to support that with um, mobile devices and um, and and tech support to go along with that. Um, and then um, and you can see some of these other models here, and of course. Um, the uh, the integration hub model will become important as the uh, as some of the administration of the vaccine becomes more distributed into into sites outside of of defined clinics and, and mobile administration models. Um, so just to give you uh, a sense of, um, uh, I think there might be a missing slide here. My apologies, but I, I did have a, a data flow slide which I know uh, <laughs> many of you would be interested in given. Um, given uh, the, the kind of the uh, secondary use and research focus of this audience. And uh, I'll see if I can find it um, for perhaps some, some questions, but I'll just end to say that um, a lot of effort has gone into um, training uh, the, the users of COVAX, uh, both so they understand how to, to, to use it as a clinical management tool, but then also to ensure that data quality is really high. Um, there are a whole host of different um, live time and, and asynchronous training models. Um, uh, there's a, you know, a service desk support. Um, and then on the right, you'll see that this category of onboarding engagement. We know um, as you bring new sites on, it's really important to be able to um, have those sites go through uh, checklists and protocols to ensure that they have everything they need from um, uh, you know, to, to ensure that they've thought through their workflow, that they have the right technology, if they are running into issues with technology itself, that they have support, to data quality, to reporting, um, and so that the whole process is really supported. Um, and I've, I've done an exceedingly quick overview, but at the end of the day, I think what's most important is that we now have an emerging um, uh, data set of you know, close to 500,000 vaccine administrations at a record level um, where, where people have provided their health card number, we'll be able to link that to all the other familiar data sets. 
Um, and we are also starting to do some really um, intense work with uh, people like Jeff and, uh, uh, and and others on this on this panel and and uh, at other organizations to look at vaccine effectiveness. Um, uh, our, our our first project of, of keen interest is um, the uh, vaccine effectiveness within the long term care population. I'm happy to to answer some questions about that. Um, I actually, uh, I can see my, my vaccine information flow slide um, is the next one, but maybe I'll just leave that uh, in case people have a specific question about that. I can always flash that up in response to a question. So I'll stop there and then we can get to the questions. So I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Susan. Thank you so much. Oh, don't tease us, Michael. Show us the data oh, flow slide. Okay, okay. Uh, it's <laughs> All right, here's the data flow slide. Um, and so uh, maybe just to, to point out a couple things, um, so you can see the COVAX Ontario uh, data repository sitting here, um, but I think what's exciting is that eventually we end up, uh, you know, it all ends up in, 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 in the um, uh, immunization repository so that we have a nice um, historical and, and up-to-date record of Ontarians' immunizations. Um, and, and, you know, so COVAX, while it will support the, um, administration of vaccines, of COVID-19 vaccines, it will eventually be incorporated into the, uh, the full compendium of, of, uh, of Ontarians' immunization history and, and be a, an enormous um, data asset for, for surveillance and effectiveness for, uh, for, for generations to come. So uh, that, that's really exciting. And I'm just so pleased that it is one provincial system that's being used because I think we've all had issues before where multiple systems have been used and you always have trouble integrating them. But, uh, but this, this, uh, this system will allow that, that one place to ensure that you have full coverage of, of uh, COVID-19 vaccine uh, information of, on Ontarians. I noticed the um, the little orange researcher on the right hand side of your screen. I was hoping there was a date attached to that. So, yeah, but yeah. we'll all hold our breath in terms of when that's gonna gonna come through. Yeah, it, um, it, you know, it's a good question. I'm not going to give a specific date, but it's we're we're very close, and we're just working through a final last little bit of analysis on authorities and you know some of those uh, some of those important but um, more administrative tasks to make sure that all the legislative pieces are, are sound and we're not inadvertently breaching or, or going further afield from where legal uh, standing would take us. So we have, we have a ton of questions that have come through. They started flowing when Sarah started speaking. Um, I've been doing my best to think about how to prioritize them and distribute them across the speakers. So maybe Sarah, I'll, I'll pose the question to Sarah and um, you can answer or if other, someone else feels like they'd like to to add to the question, uh, feel free to, but don't feel like you need to contribute to every question. Uh, there's lots of um, interest from the audience for all of you across a whole host of topics. Um, so Sarah, I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about the extent um, to which some of the data captured about vaccine safety might be reported to the public as it's collected. Um, there are um, questions about whether that might help reduce vaccine uh, hesitancy. Uh, and then a related question was, um, you know, the use of some of the terminology or the categories. So talking about severe and unusual events um, and whether that um, might contribute to vaccine hesitancy, if those kinds of terms are out in public as well. Thanks for those great questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those questions highlight this sort of central kind of challenges around how to balance transparency. Um, and I think we certainly feel at Public Health Ontario, that's why we've been since early January producing a weekly epi summary. I think it's, you know, I think we have the perspective that it's really important to be transparent, to share the information that is coming into our passive vaccine safety surveillance system so that, you know, we're sharing that with, you know, anyone who wants to visit our website. But the flip side of the coin is, I think, sort of the, the second part of the question around some of the surveillance case definitions. So that sort of other unusual severe event, I mean, I can give you some examples of that. You know, we, we certainly are aware of 
you know, frail elderly individuals who after vaccination have, you know, some sort of febrile immune response, they stop eating and are, you know, not their usual selves and have been transferred to hospital for a couple of days. And that sort of clinical description isn't really captured in any of our other surveillance case definitions. And so it ends up um, being reported in, in that other category. But I do think it is an important point around, you know, what we normally just sort of, I guess, sort of consider our sort of standard terminology and sort of thinking forward in terms of what that looks like in terms of the public's uh, perception of it. Um, I'll just add one final point, which is, you know, one of the things that we do attempt to do with our weekly epidemiologic summary is to try to provide as much context as we can for, in particular, the serious, what, what are described as serious APHES. So, as I mentioned earlier, the four that we've had to date in our epi summary are all hospitalizations. And we, see, we do try, you know, to, to obviously balance the privacy of those individuals with still providing some contextual information to try to you know, contextualize the, those those events um, because oftentimes the clinical history, in terms of what we have at our our end, you know, provides a lot of insight into um, how concerning or not the event is. So, I appreciate the questions. I think it really is something that we think a lot about, and I think something that certainly I can bring forward to our team in terms of how we might be able to apply, as, um, you know, a more focused lens on, on some of the terminology. So thanks. Great. Jeff, did you have anything you wanted to, to add? Um, no, I think, I think Sarah addressed those questions really well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so another question um, that's come up in a variety of forms uh, relates up to the trade-off or thinking about prioritizing key groups for vaccination versus the desire for having a rapid scale up of getting vaccines out into the um, population. Jeff, I know this is an issue that you feel passionate about. I wonder if maybe you wanted to start the discussion and then Sarah and Michael can add. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, NASC has provided guidance. That's the National Advisory Committee on Immunization on how to prioritize. And they just released some documents, I believe, yesterday or the day before, um, you know, where they basically said, you know, I think age is probably the number one criterion, um, you know, for deciding, you know, how to prioritize the uh, rollout of the vaccine. Uh, other considerations, you know, are like things like, you know, having chronic medical conditions. But I think the biggest, the strongest predictor of death is actually age and not um, a lot of the, you know, chronic conditions. Um, but another consideration might be, you know, looking at areas where there's higher transmission. Um, and so, you know, because it's not just the risk of death if you get infected, but there's also the risk of actually getting the infection that we might want to take into consideration. So that's why, you know, there have been some recommendations, you know, for prioritizing uh, racialized groups and other um, groups that are at greater risk of COVID-19 infection. Um, and so maybe you combine the two where you find areas or groups where there's high risk of infection, and then you, uh, you know, you go after the oldest members, you know, in, that pop in those populations, because they will be at the higher risk, you know, so an 80 year old who lives in Brampton, let's say, you know, is probably a much higher risk, at, you know, than an 80 year old um, who lives in, you know, Kappa State Sing or some other place. Sarah, Michael, anything further? I, I might just add, uh, uh, and thanks for that opening statement. That you know, you you would have seen the the recent announcement about uh, you know expanding to to you know some of the, some of our older adults in the province, and and I think um, you know we're all really um, waiting with great anticipation when the, when the supply starts up in earnest again. Um, we we've had to I think pivot a couple times on. On, on making uh, choices and, um, you know, the initial prioritization of the long-term care resident population, uh, you know, and, and then we, we were able to, you know, visit every single home and get really high uptake in, in the resident population, which I think is, is great because of the morbidity and, 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 and burden amongst that population. But just to say that, uh, you know, once, once the supply starts up as, as we've, expect it to, you know, the, uh, you, you're not as beset by very difficult prioritization choices. Um, and, and I'm just pleased that uh, we've, we've been able to announce the, the expansion to these, these older adults, um, you know, over the weekend. So I'll uh, pass it back to you, Susan. Thank you. 
So I think um, your comments on the, the rollout, Michael, are interesting in the context of some of the questions that have come in. So um, I think there's one question that's uh, maybe applicable to all three of you, which relate to the big, some of the biggest lessons learned to date from the current vaccine rollout. Um, and how some of these uh, challenges might be addressed as the rollout is expanded. And then there's also a related question looking at um, timely information related to rollouts. So helping the general public understand um, progress on the rollouts themselves. Um, and if there are suggestions there in terms of how governments and researchers might be able to do that. Uh, Mike, do you want to go first? I mean, if you, you know, I think once the COVAX data start flowing, we'll be able to do a lot of reporting at ICS on like, you know, exactly who's been getting vaccinated so far. Um, so similar to the reporting that we've got on our dashboard about who's getting COVID-19 infection, uh, we can do similar reports on who's been getting vaccinated. So our, you know, like, we've already hit all the long-term care homes, which is great, but among the workers, you know, there's a, are, is a higher rates in, in some areas and others. And, you know, um, who's not in long-term care, who's been vaccinated, you know, are there differences by socioeconomic status, um, you know, by comorbidities and that sort of thing are things that we can look at. Um, I, I, obviously we haven't been vaccinating, you know, the people with comorbidities, but we've been going after healthcare workers. Um, but, you know, we might see that there are some people with comorbidities who are included amongst the healthcare workers or, you know, already vaccinated. Maybe, maybe a good related maybe. question, Jeff, on that topic is some, um, is just as, as those data start to come in, there'll be some issues uh, with generalizability on the initial findings, like the, um, the first groups are the most vulnerable and then moving towards the general public being vaccinated. And I, I don't know, Sarah, when you're thinking about your analyses and your reporting, how you think about taking some of those generalizability issues into account. Yeah, maybe I can start and then I'll, I'll look to Jeff and, and to Mike to add to it. I mean, I think that um, I absolutely agree with you in terms of thinking about um, at the individual level, looking at vaccine effectiveness, um, you know, so, so as distinct from looking at sort of population impact of a program in terms of, you know, outbreaks in long-term care, et cetera, which I think is a really important component. But I think there are a lot of really interesting methodologic considerations. It's not just about generalizability, but also just, you know, force of infection, you know, thinking about these groups uh, prioritized for early doses um, being at very high risk. Um, and so, so I think that's one, that's one piece, but, but I think, you know, um, Soon our, you know, the good thing is, I mean, we certainly need to have additional vaccine supply, but I think, you know, over the coming months, we're going to move eventually outside of a very targeted priority based rollout to more of a population based rollout. Um, and I think all of the comments you mentioned earlier in terms of our ability to really understand um, determinants of uptake, et cetera, can really feed back into the program planning and sort of um, further adjustments to um, how the program might be delivered to, to reach underserved groups. I look to see to Jeff and Mike if they have anything additional to add. Yeah, I, I might just, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, Oh, I was I was thinking about your um, your first question, uh, Susan, and um, uh, I think that you know lessons learned. Um, I just wanted to say you know to to all the you know first to to Sarah and Public Health Ontario. I think we've been doing some really great work um, understanding the Covax data. I mean, it's still a very brand new data set, um, and and I think we've come a long way to. Um, parsing through it and cleaning it and standardizing it and and you know all those really important steps you need to do before you can start using it analytically um of course we've been trying to use it in parallel analytically and 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 it's um i think it's really close now i'm 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 very pleased with our collaboration there and then you know lessons learned i mean i just wanted to give a huge shout out to all the public health unit um partners out there these incredibly knowledgeable dedicated medical officers of health i mean the, our last major vaccination campaign you know of this kind of scope and scale was was a few well what in in uh, like oh, oh nine i guess um and 
I, I think it was maybe 10 or 11 million uh, vaccinations were given and in the public health units, you know, they, they, they had tackled it with their, their knowledge and their professionalism. And that's, you know, we're going to rely on that same base of expertise for this rollout. And, you know, my lessons learned are, are, you know, just, just going through the vaccination plans and discussing them and, and doing, uh, you know, proofs of concept uh, and, and discussing all the kinds of things that can go right and go wrong. And, and, um, and I think, I think we've, we've gone through so many of those with all the different public health units. And of course, you know, we've got General Rick Hillier, you know, leading the charge with um, his leadership. And I think, you know, he's been a real galvanizing force for, for the vaccination program and, and, and bringing all the partners together, because it's not just the public health units, it's the it's the hospitals and, and soon it'll be all, you know, different points of administration. So I just get your plans down, discuss them with your partners. Um, don't have any assumptions and, 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 you know, for this crowd in particular, um, keep focusing on data quality because it'll make all our lives so much uh, easier, um, both to look for, you know, gaps, um, but also to do like the really important vaccine effectiveness studies and, and surveillance studies that will, um, you know, be of, of generalizable global interest in the research literature, but then also more importantly, maybe in the near term of local interest to make sure all our, our key populations are getting covered. Thank you. Yeah, maybe um, I'm, I'm looking, looking, we're not going to have time to get to all the great questions that have come through, but um, thinking of international and global interests, I wonder, um, Jeff, if you want to talk a little bit about our ability to um, plan or look at uh, vaccine effectiveness for the specific variants of concern um, and whether you think this can be done and how it might be done within the context of the data we've got available in Ontario and Canada. Yeah, yeah. so we do get uh, data on the variants of concern coming through our OLIS data feed. Uh, and we're actually in the process of, of cleaning those data. So we can actually you know, do our... Uh, VE studies, um, you know, once we have enough uh, of, you know, cases of people who've had the variants uh, infection. So I think that's something we can do. And I, I'm, I think, we, you know, I can talk to the partners in other provinces to see if they'd be able to do it as well. And that, I mean, the timeliness there is, I guess you'll know when somebody tests with a variant of concern and it'll just take the usual lag time to wait for the various outcomes to, to show up in our data. That's I, say, right. I say I say hour in an Ontario sense in yeah, addition to an yeah. ICS sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first outcome will be lab confirmed infection, and then we'll also look at the more severe outcomes. You know, once the data are available, but I, like right now, we're just waiting for the vaccination data. Is like the number one priority. Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add on the um, topic of variants? Well, I think Jeff summarized it nicely in terms of the plans for vaccine effectiveness. I know just in the conversations I'm having with my colleagues at Public Health Ontario on the lab side of things, I know, you know, there is um, there's also interest in, you know, outside of variants of concern that we're aware of also um, setting up a strategy to do whole genome sequencing of vaccinated cases so that um, so that we have the opportunity and the ability and the capacity to identify I'm um, looking for some wood to knock on. Hopefully this doesn't occur, but, you know, looking for additional mutations, looking for things outside of just the variants that we know we need to be looking for to have the capacity to, you know, have the strategy in place to look for anything unusual that might be popping up in, among vaccinated individuals. Um, so we're, we're talking about what that would look like in terms of how to facilitate that. Um, so, so that's sort of maybe just an additional additional sort of component in terms of thinking about surveillance and variants of concern um, as it relates to vaccinated populations. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to trying to juggle all my my screens here while while we're talking. Um, so I think. Um, Maybe there's time for for one more uh, question, and this is um, came out during Sarah your your talk, but was a little. We've talked about who's included in the um, vaccination data. 
Uh, but there were some questions related to who's excluded and sort of implement, uh, you know, impl implications for both research and for implementation. Um, you know, specifically questions about, you know, recommendations for pregnant women or other individuals and how, how we think through those kinds of challenges as a province. So this is a question about sort of thinking about sort of programmatic delivery for excluded populations. Is that sort of along the lines of yeah. the, yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate the question. I think this has really been a hot topic um, since December when the mRNA vaccines first received their approval under the interim order. And I'm sure everyone's well aware that although, you know, there were large clinical trials that study those two different vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine that they did, um, they did exclude uh, pregnant individuals, they excluded breastfeeding individuals, they excluded immunosuppressed individuals, and although it wasn't a formal exclusion, there was very limited numbers of people with autoimmune conditions. And I think um, as, a, as a member of, of NACI, I can say that, you know, I think it's really challenging for immunization committees that do take a very structured evidence-based approach to you know how to handle vaccine recommendations when it's not just that there is poor quality evidence there's literally no evidence when you have as various groups excluded from clinical trials and so that's part of the the backstory in terms of why the NACI statement which has been revised a few times part part of that revision is to provide some clarification on the on the language but as i'm sure everyone's familiar with there is discretionary recommendations for use of the vaccine in those excluded populations that involves a risk benefit uh, counseling discussion. And I know there's a lot of challenges with the implementation component of that. I've heard about that from public health unit colleagues and clinicians alike. Um, and I think that's something that, um, you know, unfortunately is sort of a, a product of sort of where we are in these vaccine programs. And I think also reflects sort of a, a certain degree of um, conservatism. I think that's not really a word, but I, I think in terms of thinking about a population level intervention. So this is outside of an individual recommendation to an individual patient who I know who's in front of me that I have a patient physician relationship with. I think, you know, what we're talking about is population level recommendations. And that's why there is that, I think, sort of um, more conservative language that's included in the absence of clinical trials um, or information from clinical trials. But, you know, with, with the rollout in not, not only in Ontario, that that um, is, you know, um, supportive of immunizing those populations with appropriate conversations. Those va vaccines are used in those populations in the U.S. and other um, countries that have large-scale rollout. So we'll very, I think, very, very soon have observational data um, involving many more people than would ever be included in a clinical trial um, to, to provide insights in terms of safety and effectiveness. And I think that, that observational, observational real-world um, information in terms of safety and effectiveness will will ultimately lead to stronger language more you know stronger recommendations for the use of the vaccines in those different populations so i think it's a matter of time um, but i think we'll soon be there very shortly thank you i think that's an excellent note to end on i note that we're we're now at time uh, you've all given us a lot to think about as we move forward in the vaccine era like to thank all three of you for presenting um, today. For those of you in the audience, we're now going to have a short break. So please go and stretch your legs or have a bite to eat. And we'll see you back um, here at uh, 12.45 p.m. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>